track actually I was telling uh, a journalist today uh, this is really weird may appear weird to some of you but uh, occupy space in my imagination of European capitals and Prague is mostly because of uh, colleagues and professors that you may know Alan Sekula uh, Noel Birch and the mic <laughs> uh, no Noel Birch and uh, Annette Michelson uh, who were at some point our professors in, uh, in the US uh, introduced us to formalism and then to uh, structuralism, post-structuralism. And Prague was one of the cities, basically, that they were, uh, they loved visiting. So I heard about the Charles River long before the promenades uh, and so on. So the same way, in, a, in, the, in this particular case, Annette uh, Michelson, uh, become uh, a colleague at NYU. She actually hired me at NYU. But Noel Birch, uh, we go way back, uh, first in Paris, uh, at my dancing days, he was somebody there. And then uh, in the United States, uh, I remember that he had a, a high, hyperbolic letter one time written for me because uh, in the U.S., we, we're pretty crazy when you, we do evaluations all the time, you know, for, for tenure, for this kind of thing, for raises. You have to get outside, outside reviewers and that, that. You know, I gave them Noel Birch's uh, email, and uh, email in those days. They wrote a letter. This was in Santa Barbara around 1985, 86, or something like that. Uh, and... Noel Birch wrote back to my university right away, said, this guy, because of this article on narratology that he wrote on Wen Cooney by Gaston Cabore, he deserved to be full professor. I was an assistant, because he didn't really care. He was an anarchist, something like that. And my chair showed it to me. He said, this is the kind of letter they're writing about you. But anyway, so Prague was on my mind for a long time. Uh, the same way you read about Paris, uh, the arcades uh, from uh, Benjamin or uh, another person, uh, or you read Paris about even in Bourdieu, you know. Uh, so anyway, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to talk about this project, uh, which directly or indirectly also uh, is a lived experience for me uh, because I'm from Mali. Uh, went to school in Guinea for the first time uh, because uh, Guinea was the first African country uh, in Francophone Africa 1958 to become independent. And I, I emphasize this, Francophone Africa, because my Sudanese friends will say, how about Sudan? And, and so on. So uh, Franco -fr former French colonies. Uh, and uh, I just heard from Yana yesterday that the president, former president of Guinea actually studied here in Czechoslovakia. So, uh, so that was something I didn't know because I knew about his uh, uh, union uh, work in Senegal. I knew about uh, his alignment with the non-aligned group. Uh, but I didn't know that he actually did really studied here. Uh, so Secretary sent me to school, and in Mali, we were uh, uh, on the left. Uh, we, we basically, you know, I want to say a little bit about the non-alignment, uh, what it meant to us, and go from that to uh, the Bandung Conference, and then come to filmmakers, if you don't mind. This is, just want to make a quick introduction in that, uh, because by non-aligned, we, we actually, this, on the one hand, there was Xuanlai, they had China, but they also have the Nehru's who wanted to, uh, or you also have the, the Soviet blocs. They each wanted to co-op the, the concept of non-aligned 
to the ideology. You know, whether the ideology in that case uh, was communism, uh, the ideology was breaking away from communism and religion like uh, Islam, Hinduism, and so on. Uh, but it was really to look for a different way of being human. I think it became clearer to me uh, when I, I started working on uh, Edouard Glissant, uh, who said, I demand, uh, je demande le droit à l'opacité. Uh, and he wanted to basically, uh, he, uh, with the Mexican poets, uh, uh, they wanted to go to the UN and say, why is it that uh, four or five countries, in powerful countries, actually decide what is human right in the world? What can to, how about all the voices of all these other countries? Uh, and so this opacity, this sense that I, there are things about me that I don't know about myself that may come out one day, that I should also assume that there are things about you that I do not know. So I consent to your opacity, then you have to consent to my opacity. Instead of saying, this is what you are. You're from Mali, you are a Soninke, you speak French, you are colonized by the French people, therefore I know you. And Gleason said, that is uh, comprendre, transparence, uh, la transparence. And, and Gleason said, remember in the French word, comprendre, you have con and then prendre. You know, so you're owning a person. If you put a, 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 a line between con and prendre, it's like you're taking the person, you own the person. And listen, saying, you actually don't own anybody. You, you have to consent to everybody's uh, uh, opacity and meet them by trembling. You meet them, uh, what he, his idea of la pensée de tremblement. You know, but, you know, shaking literally, uh, tremulously, uh, gingerly. You go, it's like dancing in a jazz music. You do this, and I do this, and we get to know each other, one another, slowly. But you can't just come and know me. This is basically Gleason's con contribution to this idea of non aligned that, that each encounter between differences is a new relation that's taking place. Uh, so uh, this was, uh, and it's this sense that I'm going after. And so in Bamako uh, in 1946, uh, there was a movement that you know, uh, was created. It's called Rassemblement Democratic African, so RDA. The plan was basically to uh, begin to unite people and begin to uh, abolish the, in, in Africa in those days in Francophone Africa again they had uh, travail force forced labor if they want to build a road they just came and recruited people and told them work here and they also have uh, it, it was completely an unequal system you know uh, French people have the right to certain functions, certain uh, responsibilities, certain jobs, and then they have les indigènes, indigenous people, uh, native people, basically, in English. In French, it'd be les indigènes. So they, they had those, and they did other kind of work. And French Communist Party, uh, in, uh, in the collaboration, in the organization with African uh, intellectuals in those days, uh, wanted to create a movement where, one, you have to abolish forced labor. Uh, two, you have to abolish this idea of uh, citoyen and indigen. Uh, and, and then you also have to allow Africans to run for political positions, which they didn't have the right to do. This is 1946. So they, they had a manifesto uh, called the Manifest du RDA, 1946. And uh, you will be surprised, it, the first meeting of this was in Paris. And it was uh, Le Paul Sedar Senghor. Uh, it was uh, Gabriel uh, Darboussier. It was uh, a Malian guy called uh, Fili Dabo Sissoko. But there were about eight people. They said, let's meet in Africa, in Bamako, and 
have a conference and organize ourselves. So you had French communists, and then you have uh, the, the, the African groups. So basically, French government heard of this, and they said, no, you can't have this meeting. Uh, and to make a long story short again, uh, and people who were discouraging people actually, you know, uh, Pompidou told Senghor, uh, I have, I'm, I'm getting married, he can't go to this uh, meeting in Bamako. That's why Senghor did, he signed a letter, he can go to the RDM manifesto, you see Senghor's signature, but he didn't go to the meeting. Uh, Derlen Zenzu from Benin also. Several people like that were supposed to go to this meeting. They couldn't go, but several people came, and this became a moment. And uh, I decided uh, around 19, in the late 80s, to do an oral history of this movement. Because when African countries reached their independence, Francophone African countries, I think 80% of them become independent with a party of the RDA, RDA. So that's 80% because of the grassroots organization and so on. So I wanted first to show you a clip of that, the clip of maybe four or five minutes of the RDA. Uh, it's 18 minutes because I abandoned the project until I was asked to do this. So that's why it's not subtitled, but I think you have the subtitle somewhere. So if you can show the clip, quickly and okay if you can't you can the you know the, okay fantastic images because I just went from different African countries and put the camera in people's face and ask them about the RDA that's what Des hommes comme Doudou Gueye, des hommes comme Mofoué Boanyim, Wezen Koulibaly, Madeira Keita, Gologo, Seydou Badian Kouyate, Modibo Keita, Sekou Touré. Je pourrais donner une liste, elle, elle est trop longue, d'hommes qui ont dit non, ne sont plus d'accord avec ce qui se passe. Réunissons nous et c'est à Bamako que ce, ce que doit se trouver. Et Bamako charge d'histoire reçoit les hommes qui, qui veulent dire non. Du 18 au 21 octobre, c'était la grande rencontre de ce qui s'appellera le Rassemblement démocratique africain. Et je me souviendrai toujours de ce jour-là où nous étions un certain nombre de jeunes car en 1946, j'avais à peine 21 ans. Et nous étions un certain nombre à nous occuper de la personne d'Ofoué Baye. Je peux, si j'arrive aujourd'hui à Bamako, vous situer le lieu. Nous sommes allés là où Fili Dabo Sissoko était sur une tribu, ovationné par toute la population. Il parlait. Et il parlait, c'est dommage, contre justement cette rencontre qui devait avoir lieu dans la capitale du Soudan français, c'est-à-dire la capitale malienne. Et nous étions là avec Ofoué, avec tous les autres camarades. Et à un moment donné, lorsqu'il a parlé d'Ofoué, Ofoué a levé la main et il a demandé... Frères, amis, doyens, Fili Dabo Sissoko, acceptez-vous de me donner la parole Fili Dabo a dit oui, il n'y a pas de problème. Nous sommes en Afrique, venez. Il est monté tout de suite et il a pris la parole. Mais alors, tout changea, tout bascula. Et c'est à partir de ce moment que tout Bamako 
décida d'aller assister le lendemain à l'ouverture de ce congrès historique qui fut le congrès du Rassemblement démocratique africain. Il faut te monter sur ce camion. Bon, il a essayé de faire comprendre la population qui écoutait euh, la présence de tous les leaders africains à Bamako. C'était un, 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 un événement historique. Parce que le but du mouvement qu'ils veulent créer, donc par conséquent, c'était pour la libérer du peuple africain. Malian who went to the cocoa plantation uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. And actually when the RDM movement started, it was bankrolled by these uh, planters, Yakuba Sida, you know, Ganywa in different places. And that's his son. He passed about three days ago. I just learned when I was in London, you know, it was, uh, this film, I shot this, uh, the Abidjan one may be around 95, 95 or something like that. Uh, the, so the point really is that by the time we get there, uh, by the time we get to uh, Bandung, uh, these organization, organizations like this have taken place in Africa, uh, all over Africa, because one could talk about the Anglophone groups to the Pan Africanisms with Kwame Nkrumah, with the Azikwes, and so on. But this is just the Francophone area. People were organized, and mostly with the Communist Party. The French Communist Party, mostly, it, they were organizing and they were be, uh, looking for equality, they were looking for, uh, for, for freedom. And then there was the Bandung Conference, the, the 55, which actually began to define these issues of alignment uh, or non-alignment is a, a better word. And uh, what, what is important, people like Ashish Nandi have written about the Bandung Conference. There is a lot of literature on it. Uh, uh, Bandung uh, in Indonesia, uh, it was a major conference, it, again, pushing people to take, to distance themselves and from the capitalism of uh, the United States particularly, but Europe, uh, and also from communism. Uh, so Bandung was quite important, and out of Bandung came a big conference in Paris. I'm again focusing on Francophone Africans. And this major conference in Paris took place in 1956. And it, it was the, uh, the Congress of African Writers and Artists, Le Congrès des Écrivains. Uh, des artistes et écrivains noirs. Uh, they, this took place, uh, started by a publication company that just was born, that is called Présence Africaine. So Présence Africaine basically was the one publishing all the major first writers and the translation, and the people behind Présence Africaine, again, were on the left. Uh, I could also tell you, uh, Louis Aragon, uh, who was one of the major leaders of the Communist Party in Paris, uh, but also Jean-Paul Sartre uh, from the United States. He had people like uh, uh, Richard Wright. Uh, so these were the people supporting African organizations in Paris, Presence African particularly. They were all on, on the editorial board. And the 56 conference is, I think the significance of it is that French people it, it took place at the Sorbonne, and they were told, come, but talk about culture. Don't mention politics. Whatever you do, don't, don't discuss politics in the 56 conference. Uh, and so they came, but Jacques Rabé Mananjara from Martinique, uh, no, no, from uh, Madagascar, for example, he came out of jail to Paris to attend this conference. And yet, he, and he was arrested as a politician, uh, in a seditionist, and he was, uh, he literally came to this conference coming out of jail. So this is one of the things that was, uh, 
quite interesting, and yet he couldn't talk about politics. So, uh, Fanon said there, Franz Fanon, that many of you are familiar with, Fanon said uh, in his paper, it's called uh, Racism and Culture. He said some controversial things in that paper, but the one thing that is quite important uh, is that he said, there is no culture but national culture. No culture but national culture. This, this was, Césaire put it with interrogation mark, but Fanon stated it, il n'y a de culture que nationale. Il n'y a de culture que nationale. And by saying that, Fanon basically was telling Africans, forget about your African traditions, the superstitious. Forget about your, your ancient histories. Take your weapons, fight colonialism, and in your fight, you are also creating your culture. So the culture is linked to the fight for the nation state. Uh, and this really followed us, and this is what you're, gonna, you're going to get in cinema. This is basically our first cinema in Africa in that sense is a cinema uh, of decolonization. It's a decolonization coming up. In Fanon's, that piece, I would recommend, it's, it's in the Presence African uh, collection of the 1956 conference. He, the other controversial statement he made was that the blues was a racist music. And he had African-American delegation in the room, and to the African-Americans, blues is the first music of freedom. Blues is coming out of the church. Blues is going to invade, place the basis for jazz. And Fanon said, yeah, but look at the blues, man. Look at the, look at the audience that listen to the blues. They are all white. Blues is a racist music. And this was real, and G, uh, Jimmy Bald James Baldwin was sitting in the room. And in fact, his review of this conference is one of the most interesting reviews. If you, it's called uh, uh, Princes and Darkness and so on. It's a, just Google James Baldwin. Well, it's in the book called The Price of the Ticket, a collection of essays by Baldwin. So Fanon said, made this statement, but the, we're talking about film here. What is interesting is that this first cinema uh, became a cinema of decolonization. So Fanon uh, made his statement, people like Sam Ben, Many of the filmmakers, they all wanted to talk about nation building in some sense. Uh, w what takes place? Uh, you have the French, uh, well, first, let's start with Saint Ben here. Saint Ben by 1963. You know, many people think that his Borom Saret is his first film. It was not his thesis film. Uh, but by 1960, Sam Ben comes to Africa. He had quit school, school in, uh, in Senegal and went to uh, Marseille uh, as a dock worker and joined the trade union and went to night school and learned how to become a writer and become a major novelist and then came to Africa, uh, you know, smoking. He had a, a, what Bourdieu called habitus. He had his pipe, he has his look, he had everything, but nobody knew him. You know, he said, I traveled from Senegal to Congo, crossed Africa, but nobody knew him. And he said, this is why I decided to become a filmmaker. I want to learn how to make cinema. Because my peop he said, my people are oral people and visual people. And cinema, therefore, is the encounter between orality and visual. This is what's important to Sam Ben. Uh, so, but he had written books like uh, Le Docker Noir. He had written books like uh, uh, Au Pays Mon Beau Peuple, L'Armatin. Major books, including uh, short stories like uh, La Noir, that you see here. So, he, he said, I want to go to, uh, to become a filmmaker. To make, so he had to go to film school. He applied for film schools in France, but he only had six year education. So he can't go to film school with six year education in the formal system. He applied to UCLA in the United States, 
uh, they rejected him to man. It doesn't make sense. You don't have the education. How can you go to film school? And Moscow took him. He went to <laughs> Soviet Union, and they took him to become a filmmaker. You know, he talks about his teacher, Don Skoy, all the time. You know, so he, he went there. And th this, this was a very important moment because in nation building, if we were to go to, uh, to, to Fanon, if we were to go to other people, uh, how do you build a nation? Uh, last night, we had a long discussion about this, <laughs> checking myself. What are the problems? still today, and these were the problems in St. Ben's time. How do you, uh, I'm from Mali, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, and Guinea, they all, they make coup d'etats, and the crowd follows them, and they want to create a revolution. And they have already done this coup d'etat five years ago, uh, 10 years ago, or sometime in Mali's case, two years ago. And so what what is the problem? It's obviously, the first problem is the, the, the distribution of the resources. Uh, because our intellectuals, including myself, our audience is really the West. Our audience is never Africa. So therefore, uh, if somebody comes and kills me because you want to make Africa better, the crowd is going to follow you, and I don't blame the crowd for following you because my life is horrible. Uh, I don't mean they want the me that they killed, but the me that is the other African guy who doesn't have anything. You know, they like, he don't have resources. So resources become very important in their distribution because the African elite is only talking to the, the Western political leaders. That, that's one. And then... Uh, Shek and I came to the point and said, there is the other major element, that's education. How are you going to become a nation without educating people around an idea? So alphabetization. Can we just begin to put everybody to school around a program? Now, I'm a, a kind of product of that. You know, I, I was 12, you know, 11, 12 years old before I went to school. Uh, the Secuture, see what is good in the RDA, that's very important, is the word no. N-O, no, uh, well in French it's N-O-N. But so, Secuture, when De Gaulle 1948 went to uh, Africa, because first French people were criticized, was well, Soviet Union first. This, how Africa became a ball game, you know, uh, a ball in the game is very important. First Soviet blocs were uh, criticizing African, uh, the France and America for being racist. Look at the way you're treating uh, your, your, your blacks in America and you call yourself democratic. How could you do that? And this is why America began to send jazz musicians and blues musicians to Africa to show that they're not racist. You know, Voice of America, if you know the history of Voice of America, it's not responding to Africans or giving something to Africans. It is responding to the Soviet blocs. It's telling them, we're not racist. Look, we're sending our people to these places, and they, you know, uh, they're communicating and so on. So they have that. And then the, the same accusation came to France to look at the way you are treating your people in, in these African countries. And similarly, uh, De Gaulle said, look, we, don't want, we have a, a, the French community, la communauté française. We're not forcing people to be French. And then he did a trip to Africa. He went to Congo, Brazzaville. What do you want to be? They, they all said, we want to stay with France. And he was supposed to go to Abidjan or to Senegal for the, the quality referendum. He said, no, 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 let's go to that country where there is a union guy. They say he's difficult. Let's go to Guinea. He went to Guinea and Sekuture said no. And this no really catapulted many African countries in Francophone area to become independent. De Gaulle was humiliated and they all got their independence. So they, we didn't really fight, and this is still haunting us in many places. That we didn't. Algeria was the only country fighting the French colonialism. 
now you know in Mali we didn't we're given our independence in Senegal and, and every other place so Samben basically is coming from that tradition of people who said no. Sam Ben and Secretary were very close friends. Uh, Sam Ben, Angela Davis, uh, they will tell me stories. Uh, I'm, I'm very privileged in that sense. Where they will go to Guinea and they will talk to Secretary until four o'clock in the morning. And so, I mean, Secretary become what he become later on uh, because he was kind of unique in that area. Uh, so Sam Ben, uh, learn to make films and he comes back and the, the one point that I want to make before I show you this clip is that with Sam Ben and this critic so this criticism is there rampant in African cinema people think that Sam Ben uh, does not does not know how to make films he just play. He doesn't know where to place the camera. He doesn't know how to do a mise en scène. He doesn't know how to do costume. He just places the camera wherever and so on. So, this is to say his his camera positions are not like uh, Idrissa Wedrago's films, or the films of Suleiman Sisse, or the films of uh, 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 Abdraman Sisako, for example. This the major criticism because Samben was the biggest critic of the Senegalese president, Senghor. He has characters that literally look like this president in all his films, you know. Uh, Makure Jige, you know, it is really playing, no matter what the theme of the film is, this guy is playing some kind of Senghor. Uh, so uh, Senghor, uh, and, uh, and of course, Sam Ben's films are against uh, assimilation. Uh, so, but so the argument I make in, in talking about Sam Ben's film is that, and this is the point I want to make, the argument I make is that Sam Ben films, the, so if you look at uh, the form and the content, in Sam Ben's cinema, the, the form actually is created by the content, as opposed to having a, a cinematic language uh, that you can bring your content to. Sam Ben's films actually have the content and the form has to form, create itself around this. This is, this is what's really important and this is at a time also, uh, the film students here know, this is at the time also when we were talking about third cinema, we were talking about imperfect cinema. The Julio Espionio Garcia and the Cuban filmmakers, third cinema, it, it, Briefly again, uh, by uh, Gettino, uh, Solana and Gettino from Argentine, the idea was to use the camera as a weapon, as a guerrilla weapon. If you, if you film a place in Latin America or in Africa, you are making that place visible. And by making that place visible, you are liberating that place. And third cinema, constituted itself as a language, therefore, against the Hollywood cinema, where all these places are invisible, and then uh, against the auteur cinema, the auteur cinema by auteur cinema, like the New Wave, like even Brazilian uh, Cinema Novo, even the Italian uh, neorealists. Even though they have sympathy with these movements, they thought that all these movements uh, actually ignored the voices and, uh, and they leave the realities of, of these different places. So third cinema was quite important. And of course, Sam Ben became a big hero, uh, not only in Cuba, the film school there, Ikae, but also in the United States. Because in the United States at that time, what was being born, uh, seven, if we jump a little bit to 73, is what we called, uh, and I arrived in the United States in 73, I didn't know anything about these things, but uh, it was what they call uh, the LA Rebellion, the Los Angeles Rebellion. Los An by Los Angeles Rebellion, they were talking about a group of African-American filmmakers, this is 1973, well, 70 to 75, who took cameras to film the police brutalizing black people. This is long before George Floyd or any moment. So they basically turned the camera to authorities. We're talking about Black Lives Matter in those days. Uh, 
So people like Charles Burnett that you probably fa uh, familiar with now, or people like uh, Larry Clark, all the way to the recent one, Julie Dash, and so on, Zenabu, Irene Davis. They, they began to do this. So third cinema become quite important uh, 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 to them. And Samben was their hero in, uh, in terms of filmmaking. There is also the Ethiopian filmmaker called, Ethiopian American called Haile Gerima. I don't know if you're familiar with his name. He was also at the UCLA at that time. And even the idea of UCLA, black filmmakers itself, is interesting because they, uh, Brian Winchester, who was one of the uh, film professors, literally recruited these people, otherwise they would not have qualified this is affirmative action to enter UCLA. And then when they qualified, <laughs> they were put into UCLA, they began to make this radical kind of cinema. They say, well, I want to film the police, uh, or I want to film the welfare system, how corrupt it is, films like Bush Mama. So what I, what I want to do is show you a clip of Sam Ben's, uh, I made a film on Sam Ben uh, with, uh, the Kenyan writer called Ngugi Wationgo. We were colleagues uh, at uh, New York University and we decided to go to Africa and make a film on Sam Ben Usman. So I want to show you that, uh, that, that first clip, uh, which will also have elements of Sam Ben's uh, uh, first, uh, first film, 1963, called Borom Saret, A Car Driver. It's quite an important film uh, because, uh, of course, you can see that Eisensteinian, I, I didn't include it in my clip, but editing, you know, the uh, high angle, low angle, high angle, low angle shooting. Uh, yeah, this is the one, but uh, it's supposed to start much, much, uh, like 13 minutes or something. Like that. Uh, what minute is this? traditionnelle. La voyait faire. Jusqu'à sa mort, on a partagé les mêmes lits. Donc, je ne sais pas, de, pour moi, c'est la femme qui est partie de la vie. Like this, because uh, he's going to be talking about Charlie Chaplin, and then we go to my clips. I'm glad it's a little longer. Though. Je sais que j'ai vu tous les films muets, à part avant d'aller en Europe, mais je ne me rappelle plus. Vous avez une photo de, de Charles Charles. Oui, à la porte. Là. Oui. Oui. Mais c'était un petit peu fasciné dans les, euh, quand j'étais école. Comme beaucoup que je pense que le monde a été. L'avantage, c'est de l'avoir rencontré, c'est un plaisir pour moi. Charlotte est un homme de grande culture. Il connaît très bien le cinéma. C'est vrai qu'il connaît les classiques qui ont précédé le cinéma, le théâtre et les dessins animés mobiles. Si tu regardes la démarche de Charlotte, quand il se déplace avec les pieds, tu regardes l'objet, tu as la même démarche avec lui. C'est pas de l'intellectuel. Ce qui fait que Charlotte est double parce que sa démarche la façon de marcher est liée à des images très anciennes, mais sa réflexion et son comportement est autre. Et de tous les acteurs qui existent, Charlot est le plus méchant. Je n'ai pas dit Charles Chaplin dans sa vie, mais Charlot est le plus méchant. Il ne pardonne jamais un Il reçoit, il donnera jusqu'à la fin du film, si tu observes qu'il donne. Et je pense que pour un créateur, quel que soit, 
So if we bear in mind uh, Fanon's idea of there is no culture but national culture, this film, uh, Zambens' uh, first film, is, uh, is quite important in a sense that there are two or three things happening uh, in the scene here. One of them is that you have a griot. A griot in these cultures is uh, the, the storyteller, the bard, the artist of the, uh, in, in the group uh, who basically can tell you your family lineage, who can tell you what they did, but could also sing and so on. So there, there is one that. And then there is the cab driver. He spent the whole day working and some people didn't pay him his cart was confiscated but the griot comes and tell him you know here you are the son of so and so you come from this you come from that this is who you are this is how important you are the money he made the whole day he gave it to the griot and the griot leaves and then you can see little exploitations going on, somebody shining, somebody shoes, and the person not paying, and so on. So earlier, the, uh, this same car driver, you see him, he's resting in his car. So high angle shot is there. And then a beggar comes who's crippled and is begging him, and then the low camera angle. Sam Ben's film school basically is all in, the, in this small scene there. So you, you see that uh, Eisenstein basically, you know. Uh, so uh, Battleship Potemkin, you can see this, you can see it in October. So uh, you see uh, Sam Ben there. So he is doing this very conflict, uh, conflicted, conflicting relation to Africa. On the one hand, he's a, he, cr he criticizes tradition. He is very tough with African traditions that are fixed, that don't change. Because this guy is in the big city now. He is in Dakar. He needs to earn a living and go home and feed his family. But yet he is pulled back by the griot, who is fat, again, in a very uh, Eisensteinian the griot is very fat, has a gold teeth, and is doing very well, and then comes and gets more of his money from him. So Sam Ben is doing this in the image in a way that he, he couldn't do it in writing. So this is what's happening here. And so the, the, the film is, is quite important. Uh, for film students, the grammar, except for the grammars that I have talked about, high angle, low angle, uh, the contradictions and so on, and what is happening here is what is happening there, those kind of homologies. Besides that, in terms of the use of the camera and the sound, it, it's not very good. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, uh, what is thinking. 
you know, like uh, the lip syncing, you know, what the, what the people are saying and how it is going with the, uh, the camera is not very clear. You, you could see that. You could also see also this third person voice that is, instead of being third per person, is coming as a first person narrative, basically. <laughs> you know, my ancestors were great and so on. This is still something that's hunting people in the area of Africa that I know well, Mali, Senegal, Guinea, Mauritania, uh, all the way to Burkina Faso to an extent where people are still very, pulled very much between tradition and modernity. Uh, and in fact, ironically, and I may be one of the guilty people in this, uh, this conflict is actually, uh, and that the pull toward the past and the tradition is actually teaching some lessons on environmentalism nowadays. The way modernity comes and destroys everything. So I'm making something negative, positive in a way, so forgive me. But actually, they had secrets about the environment that modernity really had, had no patience with. Uh, this is what we're seeing more and more uh, nowadays. They, they, this, they understand, for example, the language of the wind, it, it, traditionally, the language of the fire, the language of the water. In fact, when we were growing up, one of the big poems that we, we, we used to recite in school was by this Senegalese poet called Birago Jop, uh, Souffle. Uh, écoute plus souvent les choses que les êtres, les vent, la, la voix du fait s'entend, entend la voix de l'eau. So listen more often to things than to people. It, so it's Edouard Glissant who comes back and revalorizes these things that Fanon had said, boom, this is no good. Saint Ben said, boom, this is no good. And then Glissant comes through opacity and says, well, you know, if you look at what's happening around the world, maybe you want to listen to some of this. They, they would, you know, because earth trembles and our ancestors used to understand the, tr the language of trembling of the earth uh, the, the waters and so on so, but if we no longer understand these languages uh, I think we're losing in, in Africa and I'm putting myself in this way I'm, I'm very bourgeois <laughs> please don't listen to that. but in Africa people the, the loss is uh, you cannot exaggerate it because on the one hand you lost the way you could teach the world about humanism because every culture has the power to humanize the world every small place there is no such thing as this place is too marginal you know uh, Prague teaches one humanism uh, Paris teaches another one and so on and so on so in that sense the humanism that different African places had to teach the world has all been obliterated. But at the same time, we did not completely, I'm being pathetic here, it's, it's, it's to some case, master some of the tools that could enable us to assert some kind of independence vis-a-vis -vis the West. Uh, to say to France, for example, no, you cannot have our uranium. You know, because the nation has come to hunt us. The nation state, if, if Niger says to France, you cannot have uranium of uh, Niger, Mali is not gonna support Niger in that struggle. We're not united. So, you know, we're losing bo in all kind of ways and we're doing small revolutions. Hopefully they will lead something, I don't know. Uh, so, but Samben was, in African cinema, I really don't know anybody as powerful uh, as Sam Ben. How am I doing on time? Because you know, I like to talk. Oh, no, I, I love your questions, <laughs> but, but you know, so. Uh, no, because what I wanted to do here is, but maybe this could come in the questions, to see how film language went from this there is no culture but national culture to, uh, of course, behind this is also, uh, so there is Fano on the one hand with the film language and people like Sam Ben Usman, uh, to a, a time when filmmakers wanted to actually say, but 
there are other cultures as well. There are, you know, cultures, revolution die, but cultures don't die. They keep transforming and transforming. They are here, so, and they still have impact on people. So I, I wanted to take uh, those kind of directions. And then maybe in the question two, we could talk about uh, things like, uh, why did Nollywood succeed, for example? By Nollywood, I mean this genre of African cinema in Nigeria, in a place where the Francophone cinema no longer is, is no longer that interesting to many people. Uh, and if it becomes interesting, it'll be a Franco-African film. Like if you have people like Mati Job with a film like Atlantic, it's a French film as well. You know, we don't call it. I mean, radically, we could have called all of Francophone African films French films. But I don't, if you do that, you'll be called racist. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, so it, but maybe I should show you one more clip of La Noire de, La Noire de by Samben, which is a black girl as, uh, based on a short story he did. Again, film language-wise, it's really problematic. But the content, again, is defining his, uh, what the form should be. So he can be in first it's cinema, it's Hollywood, it's or it's any of, yeah. I think it was like 18 or 20, I'm not sure. Oh, no, not earlier, the other one. It's in the same uh, clip we have. Yeah. yeah, in this one, the uh, one, 20. Integrate the list of the continent African. Les bonnes qui viennent du Mexique vers les États-Unis, c'est par charité, par charité, où est la différence? Nous avons vu aux dernières élections même. So il est comparé avec le même caractère la noire de l'immigration. Deux ministres qu'on a renvoyés parce qu'ils employaient des employés, des femmes frauduleusement. Est-ce que c'est pas de l'esclavage? Quelle différence y a-t-il entre la noire de et ces gens? Et alors? I love this about Africa. She's a maid, but look at the way she's dressed. You should see her come out of the boat. She's coming out of the boat, but she looks like Sheila, Sheila or Sylvie Vartan or Petula Clark. Que doit-on penser de moi, Dakar? Douana est heureuse en France. Que je vis bien. La France ici, c'est la cuisine, le salon, la salle de bain et ma chambre à coucher. Où sont les gens qui habitent ce pays Madame me disait, tu verras, Duanna, il y a de beaux magasins en France. Est-ce ce trou noir qui est là Qu'est-ce que je suis ici Cuisinière, femme de ménage, blanchisseuse. L'esclavage aura duré trois siècles à Corée, de 1536, premières escales portugaises, à 1848, date de son abolition par la France. Trois siècles pendant lesquels 15 à 20 millions de Noirs, émanant de toute la fille de l'Ouest, ont quitté Corée pour les Amériques. Elle l'étudiait hier aussi. Il a dit pourquoi tu fais attention, plus attention aux marginaux qu'à la bourgeoisie. Parce que la société africaine, je oui. parle, je ne généralise pas, ne progressera qu'avec les marginaux. Ce n'est ni les villes modernes, ni la brousse qui va créer une nouvelle société africaine. Ce sont les habitants suburbains qui sont entre les deux. C'est là, presque, c'est là où va se être le coup. C'est la base vers le sommet. Et, et, et la femme dans la noire de euh, faisait partie de... La, la blanche ou Jauna Non, non, Jauna. Jauna fait partie des victimes expiatoires, prédestinées. La société est comme ça. Tout groupe m'a aimé. Et... Mais j'aurais pu arrêter le film à sa mort. Bien sûr. Je l'ai porté avec l'élément mythique qui est le masque et l'enfant. <rires> Là, il faut 
voir. Ouais. Et moi, j'ai dit, si, il y a 150 ans, comment les gens vivaient ici What is great about this film? It won awards, but among other uh, reasons, what's great about it is uh, that the story of the mask, the black girl, the main character, she is uh, coming from Gore, she's look for a job, and then she find a, a French expatriates and they gave her a, a babysitting job. And then when they were moving to France, she's cheaper, they just took her with them. And then she was so happy, so grateful, she just went and uh, bought a, an African mask for 50 francs and gave it to her uh, boss. That's a present. So in a, you see, this mask issue restitution discussion that we're having today is, is, here, is present in the film. So she gave them the mask, and then she became the maid. She went to Paris with the same dream that people like myself had when we were going to Paris. Because I assume that when I go to Paris, by the time I went to Paris, I knew Johnny Hallyday, I knew Sylvie Barta, I knew Antoine, I knew Michel Polnareff, I knew my James Brown, my Jimi Hendrix, I knew my Baudelaire, I knew my Mallarmé. So therefore, I, I'm, you know, hip. I can be like everybody. But I realized my blackness in France. In, in Mali, I was a, a citizen of a nation or a, a, a member of a, a tribe. I'm a Soninke from Mali. That's how I knew myself. It's not that I didn't know that I was black. But black as my identity, I, I realized this in France. And this is true for many. Uh, well, today with the African-American culture's influence on the world, not just my, Africa, yes, you know about yourself, black and so on. But in, when I was growing up, and that's not a long time ago, you were from Mali. You were colonized. You were of this ethnic group. Of course, racism was underlying all of that. But still, he didn't know your, your identity as that. But when he go to France, that become my lived experience as a black. I thought, I'm hipper than, than all these French guys. I know more than they do. How come they treat, treat me like this? So this is among many reasons why I went to the United States. Because uh, uh, I didn't see much feature. I, I also went to a very radical French school called Vincennes. You know, so this maybe that too was another catalyst reason. But so black girl is interesting because we go back to the Fanon notion there is no culture but national culture. Suddenly San Ben is going to the mythical reason for the mask. It, because for me, at that time in the US, uh, we were well every time in the U.S. There is U.S.-Mexico issue about immigration, exploitation, building the wall. So I came with these ideas and I was asking Sam Ben. And in the Clinton ad administration in those days, what a woman called Zoe B uh, Bird lost her job because she, was, she had a Mexican maid in her apartment. And she was a major uh, in the Clinton government, and it became a big news. Of course, some men knew about these things. So, this is what I went for in the film. I wanted to bring the immigration, exploitation. Some men said, and then I also said, why did she have to die, some men? You know, it's a film. You could, because you could have done anything. So, so basically, some men said, no. She died, but the most important thing is the mythical element, the mask. Because the white boss brought the mask, the, the suitcase of Joanna, all her clothes and money, and the mask back to Africa in the film. And then the young, uh, and on his way back, he's followed by a young boy, Senegalese boy, who put on the mask, which become alive. And then you see the guy walking very fast to, st to get away. Uh, so th that element is very important. I and mean, when you see the film, I mean, the cutting here that, that we didn't do well, I, I, I would have done something that is to include this scene in the film in, bl uh, in Black Girl where 
the woman said, but you gave me that mask, it's mine. And then the, the, the maid, Joanna, said, no, it's mine. And this, it's so Eisenstein. So they're pulling the mask, no, it's mine, no, it's mine. So who owned the mask? It's in a powerful moment in the film. And I definitely should have included it in the cut here. I mean, so I recommend Black Girl uh, because it's suddenly problematizing these ideas of the power of tradition and culture that doesn't die, you know, it may go to sleep, but it would always come back to haunt you. And also the, uh, the, the necessity for modernity, because you can't run away from it. Uh, uh, it. We have to modernize, but how do we modernize ourselves ecologically, taking environment into account? Uh, not only the exploitation uh, by the outsiders, but how we destroy the land ourselves. We need to take this thing into account. So that, that, that's really what I wanted to do with Black Girl. So maybe I'll stop here for questions. All right, thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Javara uh, for this uh, very nice and very somehow authentic and fascinating talk <laughs> with a lot of uh, personal experience uh, from your life. Um, I will ask a few questions just to begin and then we'll pass uh, um, around to the public. Um, I was particularly struck by the way how you spoke about this controversial text by Franz Fanon. Um, about the fact that any culture is in a way a national culture and um, you somehow highlighted that it's a very problematic text in, in, in many ways because I was wondering to what extent can we see for instance Fanon as precisely being a product of something that's in culture precisely going beyond the national culture the Marxism you know we in our seminar we're discussing also those ideas of the potential of this kind of a socialist internationalist ideology as a, perhaps a unfulfilled dream of the 60s is this idea of precisely going, creating a culture that wouldn't be necessary a national culture. And in a way, if we look at figures like uh, Sam Ben, you know, studying in Moscow, and in our seminar we also discuss these cases of, you know, students from all around Africa, uh, this uh, studying film and arts like in 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 Eastern Bloc countries or you know in in Soviet Union to what extent is there something like a dream of a precisely a culture that would be a truly internationalist culture it would be a culture of emancipation linked to Marxism you know as precisely the driving force behind these all national uh, liberation movements. So I kind of wanted to provoke you to ask you what would be your position? Uh, you as a thinker, as someone who's very fond of Edouard Glissant also on this statement of France Fanon. Thank you. In a way, uh, so this conference, I will recommend it again, 1956, Presence African, the Congress of Black Writers and Artists. And uh, it, it, Fanon's essay, Racism et Culture. It's also translated into English, uh, it, it exists. So in many ways, one of the, I'm glad you're asking this question actually, because several people responded in different way in the uh, colloquium, uh, the Presence African colloquium in a, in a way, because you had many Marxist communist in this meeting, you know, uh, Césaire was in the Communist Party, uh, Richard Wright was in the Communist Party, uh, but so let's uh, uh, respond to this. One of the things that came up in the conference was the question of universalism, the particular and the universal uh, that Césaire talks about. Césaire said, uh, it says that respond 
to, to an extent to Fanon, but uh, to your question uh, in a more articulate manner before we get to uh, uh, Glissant, Cesar's argument is that Catholicism has to agree to become a black Catholicism. Marxism has to agree to have black Marxism. Uh, that universal, it, it, so the universal in this sense, uh, because it's it's uh, embedded, it's embedding uh, the culture of the colonizers. Even Marxism comes with a kind of cultural bias toward people. So therefore, how do you have black Marxism? And, it was much later that uh, a very powerful writer who was a colleague and a good friend of mine who gave me my first job in the United States, actually, Cedric Robinson, he wrote a book called Black Marxism. You know, if you, if you, if you Google Cedric Robinson, he has a book called Black Marxism, and he basically is following the, the trajectory of the blacks who were in the Communist Party like Padmore, Padmore uh, like C.L.R. James, uh, uh, like uh, Richard Wright II, uh, and going back to the, the Haitian Revolution, uh, to Saint Louverture, and so on. So, and it, in this very powerful book, which is now a little Bible for people like Fred Morton, for people like uh, uh, Saidia Hartman, they are all citing this book. It's called black Marxism. Uh, so Marxism as an emancipatory language is a must, but Marxism can come with culture. So how do you, every culture, try to use its own Marxism? And this does, does not stop us from being uh, universalist. Uh, it's, it's when we have the particulars and the particulars come together. This, this was very important, uh, both well, first to Caesar and then uh, more better articulated by, uh, by Cedric Robinson in his book called Black Marxism. It's a very dense language, but it's really worth reading. Uh, it, it, it's worth reading uh, in that sense. So when Gleason come to that, uh, you know, I, I always get myself in t trouble uh, I said that Fanon taught me how to think, and Gleason liberated me. In, a, in terms of thinking, the way I grew up, going to France, doing black studies, because my background is really black studies. Uh, you know, as an African who goes to the United States after studying in Bamako and uh, Paris and Kanka in Guinea, uh, black studies taught me to look at the world in a different way. Uh, so I'm very different from your Francophone African intellectuals in that sense, because they, they're very French to me, no matter how radical they seem, whether it is Ashir Mbembe or Bashir, or even my best friend, Mamadou Jouf, they, they're French men, you know, <laughs> to me. <laughs> my background is very different from that uh, in many ways, and to, to the black British too, I'm, I'm completely... I'm able to take my distance and claim my Africanity, but I'm really a product of black studies uh, in many ways. Uh, because the emancipatory language of that and they look for the freedom as something that keeps changing meanings. You know, I, 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 my last film on Angela Davis, uh, she basically thinks that the most revolutionary language of freedom today is owned by LGBTQ, and black studies need to realize that. It was a radical, you know, because she's saying, uh, she's talking about black racial capitalism, how we got our uh, freedom in the United States, but we're using that to exploit other people. So, the, so if, you, if you're following freedom, you have to see the changing language of freedom. Uh, at some point, black studies, um, black people in America were the most revolutionary. And that la racism still exists in America. I'm not trying to say, oh, America is great, you know, which I can say also. But uh, black America still 
as racist as ever if people had their way. But we, America also provides us with weapons to defend ourselves now better than before. So, but those weapons, if you look, where are those weapons denied today? It would be in the LGBTQ communities. It would be in other minorities, migrants coming, either from Mexico and so on. This is Angela Davis's main argument. So freedom, you cannot just fix the meaning of it. Uh, the, the, and and Gleason is really one of the major think, thinkers in this. He, he, uh, if, you, if you look at Poetics of Relation by Edouard Gleason, that book, or uh, even Caribbean discourse, Le Discours Entier, there are books that are trying to create a, he, well, when his, when his passport was confiscated, because he too went to Tunisia like Fanon, trying to go to Algeria. And then when he went back to Paris, they took his passport away, he, he's in Martinique. He created a school called uh, Institut uh, d'Etudes Martinique. And in this way, he wanted to change the French language in a very profound manner, going from very simple things like there is winter, and there is summer, and there is a climate. And Gleason said, but we in the Caribbean, we're not in France. What do we have this? Because you know, like in Mali, suppose we say, I'm neither. And some people may use this in French. You know, there is no winter in Mali. But the French language is forcing us to call seasons winters, uh, uh, summer, autumn, printemps, and so on. So the Institut d'Etude Martinique began to change the French language and give it new meanings. Because they, they, they began to say, uh, and this is quite interesting actually for me, they began to say, it, 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 that French language is trying to make everything transparent. So anything that's complex will have to get out of the way. And I didn't mention this about Sam Ben when I say he went to back to Africa. The novels that he wrote, if you read them, and you look particularly, you are an editor, Jan, you look at the syntax, it's perfect French. I've been talking about the bad grammar in, in his films, but he's Docker Noir, au pays mon beau peuple. The French is impeccable because there is an editing uh, house. You know, you say your thing, the editor takes it, put it in the so called good French. This, this could be seen in Sam Ben's earlier novels. I think he began to Africanize a little bit in Le Bout de Bois de Dieu to some extent. Uh, but in one of his films called uh, Kala, he said, even when you insult people, you have to do it in the plus pure tradition de la francophonie. You know, you have to speak good French. Even when I'm insulting you, I can't insult you in African French. I have to do it in a very, very good French. You know, this was very important to Sam Ben. So, so Glissant, look, I think the answer to your question is that when you're defining the universal, let me go back a little bit to Fanon. Fanon, when they began, the, he, he, he gave up on his uh, passport, French passport, and became Algerian and joined the, the NFL uh, War of Liberation. That's what Fanon did. And Fanon was advising the African leaders to build a nation first and then Pan-Africanism second. He said the same thing about Pan-Arabism. Pan-Arabism is second. First, build the nation. This is the way Fanon was thinking when he talked about universalism, like we are all Arabs. Fanon said, no, Be build the nation first. Uh, so the, the, the idea is very controversial, <laughs> but it, it was, uh, you know, I think it was shared by, so because the communists wanted the Africans to get the independence so urgently, and they knew that the only way to do that is to get rid of the chiefs, the religious leaders, and the chef de village, chef de canton, they were all African culture, gerontocracy, 
he wanted to get rid of those so he said let's take the weapon Cabral said this better than than, than Fanon but uh, so, so this is what happened uh, it's a long answer to your question but I, I could go on forever because it's very important the particular and the universal that's how the particular get changed into universal is what's important in your question in order to join the you know, universal struggle. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Javar. Um, I think this, again, it's a discussion that, as you said, we could continue for hours. Uh, I think what I found really fascinating is to think to what extent, well, there's something universal, clearly, which is perhaps a um, little bit like uh, in dissonance with the way that some writings, even by someone like Fanon, are being read today. Because if I remember well, even in The Wretched of the Earth, you have the, those passages where he clearly says there's no national struggle for liberation without an internationalism. So there clearly is a dialectic between something that's universal, but it can be embodied in a very different particular, uh, particular ways. And I think also to mention some historical examples, then you mentioned, for instance, Aimé Césaire. So we could think, uh, for instance, about the conflict of Aimé Césaire with the French Communist Party, his famous split with the PCF, even the somehow very controversial position of the French Communist Party, for instance, towards the war in Algeria, um, you know, the 68 movement and so on. Um, and so I wonder, like, um, again, uh, what can we do, um, you know, what can we do about this, um, this um, like, how can we articulate this problem, again, of the universal and the particular also in relationship to especially African cinema. Again, we see someone like Sam Ben using a clearly kind of, as you said, very simple language, international language of cinema, sort of a uh, link to the Moscow school of cinema in order to rethink somehow in his films, as in Mandabi or as in Borom Saret, the kind of a difference between, uh, let's say, the modernity uh, and the tradition. So you mentioned, for instance, uh, if you look at Borom Saret, there's a clear conflict between um, the main hero, uh, the question of social class versus the kind of aristocratic lineage. And in a way, the hero falls victim to this contradiction between, on the one, st uh, one hand, the kind of traditional space where his identity is clearly you know, identified, you can also read it on architectural scale. The relationship, for instance, between the white metropolis of the plateau versus the informal Medina uh, neighborhood. So, to what extent do you see like this link between the particular and international being embodied in the very cinema of Semben? And how would you describe it, perhaps if you talk about your experience from Africa today, uh, like how does this transform somehow in the present if we want to somehow stretch it to the present? Yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, in a way, uh, I think you're right. Uh, Richard Wright uh, resigned from the Communist Party because the Communists in Chicago in all the meetings insisted on only seeing him as black and using uh, the, the black people as a way to criticize the American capitalism. So uh, on the one hand, the black people saw Richard Wright going to the party meetings, so he was lonely. They, they didn't like to see that. They, they didn't like him. And then in the Communist Party, too, they see him as black. They never see his identity. This was his main reason. And uh, of course, you, you, you completely you write about uh, M. Césaire in the famous letter to Maurice Torres, you know, his resignation letter from uh, the, the, the Communist Party. Uh, they are trying their best to, to, to define the relation in both cases of. Uh, between the, the particular and the universal. 
the universal problem for them, the problem in, in the French universalism, French people probably unlike any other culture, they love to generalize. They, li they like to theorize. This is this. Je pense donc je suis. You know, the people like Gleason and say, no, uh, you are not. You know, uh, because you are always becoming. So Gleason, uh, Gleason has a whole thing about être étant. Être, c'est le verbe être, to be. And then étant is this extension in time. And as you keep changing with time, this was very important. And therefore, the, this generalization of the, the French culture, the, the theorizing everything, oh, the German did it too. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm just saying uh, it's easier for me to attack French culture, uh, and I'm part of it. So, it's, uh, I, you know, it's easier to attack cultures that you know something. But, but uh, so. I think what one need what to try to answer your question, I will go back to Glisson to say the universal need to learn to tremble in front of the particular. The universal cannot come with the strong thought. You know, by strong thought, it's not a good English uh, translation. You know, I'm talking about Vatimo's uh, Panse Bolero. You know the weak talk, or the the but, but he he introduced this notion of weak thought. Instead of having the strong way of thinking, you approach life, you know, slowly. You know, uh, you don't act like I know it. The universal need to tremble a little bit in front of the particular, every particular in that sense, and the universal need to think to see, it's a particular, here is the main point. I think Glissa answers your point because it's a very important point here. The Glissa always say, when I ask for my right to opacity, I don't mean that I'm gonna retreat into some kind of autarky. You know, that black youth who says a black thing, you don't understand. Glissa said, no, that's not it. I don't mean that I'm going to retreat into something that no one else understands. This is what was important to Gleason. Gleason is saying, I demand the right to opacity because I, I consent to your opacity. How do we meet for after consenting to your complexity, my complexity? So the universal can, in that sense, say, this small thing here in Japan maybe has the power to change or to add something to humanity. But don't close the door. So maybe this would be Gleason's way of answering this question, that I'm not trying to say I'm an African from Mali and no one else understands this but me. No, I'm, I'm a human being and we can talk and the door, even my Africanity is not fixed. It keep being defined. Because Gleason has a uh, again in Poetique de la Relation, these concepts about uh, uh, totalité fermée et totalité ouverte, closed and open totalities. Glissant is more in favor of a totality that's not totalitarian, that's not totalizing, but totality that is always open, that you can never close, but you keep looking for it. You keep trying to reach some, uh, uh, your definition. You don't stop. You don't stop your work because you say, oh, I can never finish this, it's tiring. But you, you keep searching, and you also argue against people who close. I mean, in, imagine this ethnocentrism in the West. So when I was a graduate student, the biggest argument, and this is, you know, at early, I finished at 85, my PhD. The biggest argument was la fin de l'histoire. How could we have la fin de l'histoire when some people have not even spoken yet? When other people, there are cultures around the world that we have not heard. Suddenly we have come to la fin de l'histoire, whether it is the Fukuyama or the, especially the French, you know. The, 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 so how can we have la fin de l'histoire when people have not, I mean, I, I understand why the point is being made in, you know, uh, again, 
us against them, Soviet bloc versus and so on. But totality is always open and every voice has the right to be heard, you know, the echo of uh, every voice, you know. Yeah, but ask that. Okay, thank you so much. And maybe to conclude, I wanted to, um, and then we pass the micro to the public, I wanted to um, return to the third point, which I think was very important in your lecture, when um, you said that in Semben's uh, movies, the form is created by the content. So in a way, it's almost like as an anti-formalist stance. And you also mentioned the idea of a camera as a weapon against the colonization. And I think this is really in important, especially for the public, because I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the Décret Laval, which was applied in the French colonies, which basically forbade any exportation, any uh, recording of movie material within the French colonies without the authorization of, uh, of the, uh, you know, the colonial authority. Um, so I think this is a, so in a way the fact that you film, that Semben films Africa as it is, is already a subversive gesture because I think this decret was in, in, in validity until what, like early 60s or, or something like that. So it really corresponds with the, the moment where he films La Noire 2, um, you know, is also a moment where, you know, it's just a few years after the abolition of this decree basically for b like creating clear censorship within the French colonies. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, with the le, le Décret Laval. But so it, it, French people, British people, Belgians especially, were so afraid of the African holding the camera. Uh, they, you know, in my dissertation, I talk about the Bantu film experiment where the missionaries were really careful. They say Africans were stupid. If you do flashback, they won't understand. If you do some kind of parallel editing, they may not understand. And so they were making these films for them, you know, the Bantu experiment this is really incredible. And it, France is notorious for banning films. If they can't stop it at the production, they say interdit après. So, uh, of course, uh, one of the big films that was you talk about recently unbanned is Afrique 50, Afrique, uh, by uh, René Bautier. A young 19-year-old communist uh, man went to Abidjan and filmed, I'm talking about the RDA here, and filmed uh, the, f uh, the forced labor and brought the film and commentary. The film was banned and didn't get unbanned until the in the 21st century, really. Uh, so you have that. Uh, and another film that actually is of interest to film students, you know that the, of course, you know your Alain René and Chris Marker and their films, whether it is a La Jete or Night and Fog or, or Sans Soleil, that came later. But you know that when they were very young, in 1952, President's African commissioned them to make a film called Le Statue Mercosy. It's a very important film, but it's, it's very critical. Again, with these ideas becoming very fashionable today, the ideas of restitution and so on. Uh, but the, the, the statue, the film is, the statues also die. And they made the film for presence African. Uh, many museums are seen uh, asking for the film now. It's on YouTube. Uh, if you speak French and bad, it, the translation is bad, but it's on YouTube. It, it, it's about how people have sent people into slavery, destroyed their cultures, and now put their sculptures in the European museums. That's basically what the film is about. But it's a very, very harsh critique of French colonialism. Uh, the statue Mercosy. And I think that so these discussions by Sam Ben, by, by Chris Marker, Alain René on uh, mask and restitution and reparation, they have been there. They're very actual today. They're very present. Uh, they're there. Uh, but uh, I think that what we have to also see is, uh, you know, your point here, 
the young generation is going in another direction. Young generation, unlike my generation, unlike the generation a little after, they're no longer asking for permission to do the work that they're doing. For example, if you look at uh, Nigeria, what they call Nollywood, so they have an economic advantage over Mali or Senegal. That is, they can produce their films and, and not care about the West at all and distribute their films inside Nigeria and recoup money and make the next film. You can recoup money with a film from Mali or Senegal. It has to be shown in Europe, in America, in other places of the world. Uh, uh, in Nigerian uh, Nalwood cinema, they don't care about grammar like some band. They only care about content and the audience. What would the audience like to see? So they have succeeded in creating a cinema that today I don't follow anymore. I used to be so fascinated. But today those films are on Netflix. Nalwood films are on Netflix. They are on you know, cable, you know, all kind of cable televisions. But it started in Nigeria. So, so you have that language. You have also the other language that's developing in Kenya, Zimbabwe, a little bit in, in South Africa. The, the Afrofuturists, the African filmmakers, young African make, filmmakers who are questioning the, the becoming of humanity. Are we going to be in this shape as men and women, or would we have other uh, shapes? So. Uh, whatever you call it, uh, well, they call it the, not the, just the filmmakers, uh, but the theories, uh, the people like Frank Witherson, they call it Afro-pessimism, afro, -pessimism, afro they, they bring these two things. We like to create a camp with Angela Davis. We have Afro-positivism, uh, pos uh, I don't know, pos no, not positivism, but positive. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. But, so you have these arguments uh, going on. Uh, but l let me not digress. I hear your question. Okay. 